welcome you to um, Digital Classicist Berlin. Um, this is our third meeting. Um, my name is Catherine Paquette, I'm one of the co-organizers. And um, just to say a little bit about Digital Classicist for those of you who might be new, this is a new venture um, that takes place every second Tuesday from 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock. Um, and the seminar series is actually inspired by the Institute of Classical Studies in London, and so we've started up the seminar series here. But our aim is really to create a decentralized and international community of scholars, researchers, students, um, who are interested in the application of innovative digital technologies to their research um, um, on the ancient world. But we really are quite open to digital classicists and hu um, digital humanists generally. Um, the uh, seminar series is not sort of owned by any particular institution, um, but it is uh, sponsored by Topoi and the German Archaeological um, Institute and a few other supporters. So we're really grateful to them for their support. Um, but the main purpose of the seminar is to really build a community of, of like-minded people um, for discussion, collaboration, to communicate our work to each other, importantly, in an informal environment where we all feel uh, uh, at ease to discuss with each other. So um, I just want to explain one thing that we do so that the seminar is available online is it is being recorded and filmed. Uh, so if you have any questions um, that you want to pose like during the lecture as you asked and our speaker is happy to take questions during the lecture, just bear in mind that you are being recorded um, until the point that we serve the wine and nibbles. <laughs> and then you can be controver as controversial as you like because we will have closed off the recording at that point. Um, so, yes, the lecture is recorded and the discussion up to the point of the wine being served. So, um, and then if you want to tweet about uh, the talk, we've got the Twitter hashtag, DE DigiClass. Um, and I think that's pretty much it for business, apart from asking you to sign the attendance sheet. So I'll just circulate that. And we've also got the program um, available for you to take away, put up in your department. Um, and now it leaves me to introduce our um, speaker this evening. So Francesco Mambrini is coming to us from the Center for Hellenic Studies at Harvard and also the German Archaeological Institute here in Berlin. Um, and he's doing work for his, his postdoctoral fellowship um, and will be explaining to us about tree banking, something which I know nothing about and I'm very excited to, to learn more. Tree banking in the world of Thucydides, linguistic annotation for the Hellespont project. So take it away. Thank you very much and uh, good evening everybody and thanks for coming here. Um, many of you have seen my face around the, the uh, German Archaeological Institute sometimes, so if you've ever you wondered what exactly is this guy doing here, now it's uh, the time to find that out. And I will explain uh, in a minute about this strange word here, tree banking. But really, I do believe that it is important to understand uh, why, what, what does that mean? Uh, why is, uh, is this important to uh, our work in the field of classics? So if there is uh, one thing that I would love to take home tonight is that uh, question up here at point one. What contribution can digital uh, corpora of uh, uh, ancient literary test play in research in ancient history? So the plan of my talk that I propose to you is that I outline somehow the problems at end while we try to answer uh, this question uh, to show what mm, current um, corpus and computational linguistics can do to contribute to a solution and then uh, I will uh, just uh, uh, explain how this all takes uh, place in the context of a project that we are uh, and I am that I am part of and that we are uh, doing uh, that is focused on the text of the ancient historian Thucydides and some chapters of uh, the ancient historian Thucydides uh, that um, narrates as a digression uh, the story of the city of Athens between the end of the Persian War in 479 BCE and the beginning of the uh, Peloponnesian War against uh, Sparta. And then I will show you a few examples of the kind of linguistic annotation that I am doing for this, uh, for this project. But Again, let's start with the questions at hand in this uh, problems. So, what digital corpora for ancient history? Well, if we think of the work of, an of uh, the historians, uh, I should say that 
the work of historians is, of course, made possible by the existence of sources, of information about the past. And these sources can be of um, whatever kind uh, we may think of. They can be te and pre preserved in early kind of, of media. It can, can be tests, artifacts, an image of artifacts, more 3D models, uh, and so on. So the first task of a historian is to collect all these sources, these documental sources, together to uh, make interplay between these sources and, um, of course, to interpret them. And uh, in doing this, an historian will probably have to rethink um, the interpretation that have been uh, given in the past in the history of uh, uh, scholarly interpretation. So if we think that way, and I try to summarize all this in this very simplified and rough model, and course model, uh, we may come up with a few answers to the question that I said before. Digital collection can, of course, be huge, as huge, mainly as huge as we want nowadays. Um, they can be interconnected and browsed together simultaneously, no matter where they physically are preserved. And, uh, um, of course, they can be queried. We can design queries and query languages to browse uh, through their content um, in order to collect as precisely and as quickly as we can uh, all the relevant material. Well, this last um, task and this last contribution that digital technologies can uh, give to the work of historians is far from being completely realized because uh, solving or uh, um, collecting uh, resources for um, questions that are of uh, historical relevance is, uh, requires to delve into the content of, the, of those documents at a far higher level than we typically do, for example, on the World Wide Web with keyword researches as we are all accustomed, like for example, in, uh, by using Google, by Googling few queries. Uh, Bruce Robertson, I think, explained that uh, very neatly in the quotation that I report here. Try to um, design a query to get all the sources, uh, not only that contain the string of test Gallipoli, but that attest the uh, Gallipoli campaign of World War I, or even much more what, for example, what architectural projects were uh, started in England during the World War I and uh, stuff like that. You will find that it's not so easy. Or at least that it requires to analyze the content of a document at uh, a fairly sophisticated level. CDOC, Conceptual Reference Model, is one answer to this, uh, to this problem which is becoming popular uh, nowadays, especially in the, in the domain of cultural heritage documents and of museum narratives. And, as it is stated in the slides, it is based on the idea that object, digital objects, whatever they are, images, documents, and so on, are representing as being involved, being part of events that take place in a space or time. Uh, here is an example taken by a slide of Dor and Stead of uh, the Yalta conferences and an image that relates to uh, an event, the Yalta conference and the end of the World War II. Textual documents are likewise uh, handled in, the, in this kind of, uh, of uh, model. But then we got one problem, because a good historian has not only to uh, deal with uh, the problem of collecting sources, he must understand and know exactly what his sources are. And if we uh, deal with uh, textual uh, evidence and with textual sources and with literary texts from, the, from classical antiquity, from ancient Greece in uh, this particular example, we got a lot of problems. We get into a lot of problems because we are dealing with big and complex works. I quoted the work of Thucydides before. It's more than 6,000 sentences, more than uh, 167,000 words. And there are a lot of things going on in this text. Uh, a lot of events that are directly narrated, entered, uh, or narrated in digressions. Like, for example, this with the war that it's the central topic of Thucydides' work, uh, lasted more than 20, 30 years. 
50 years are narrated in the digression that is in the chapters that I quoted before uh, of book one, uh, from 89 to 118. And uh, there are references to events that go back to the legendary times of uh, Greece uh, prehistory, like the Trojan War. Of course, we are not only dealing with an uh, structured natural language, and we all know, uh, we can all guess how difficult it is to extract um, content from natural languages, because there are a lot of ways to explain, uh, to express, to give expression to the same content. But we are dealing in that case, as we, uh, as you all know, I think, understand very well, with a kind of particularly difficult uh, natural language, which is ancient Greek. It's a language that is not spoken anymore, of course. It requires a lot of uh, philological and linguistic training uh, to be understandable. And we are dealing with controversial texts, texts that were exposed to a process of hand copying and hand transmission for centuries, in which they were deteriorating and much of their meaning and uh, original references were lost and must be painfully reconstructed by scholars. Uh, so not only the interpretation of the words is linguistically or uh, talking about the content difficult, but even sometimes even the test itself is difficult uh, because uh, we sometimes have the suspicion or sometimes we have the evidence because our uh, witnesses and manuscript disagree that, uh, that the test itself is not to see this, for example. And of course, we are dealing with literary works, works that were composed for uh, a context, for a communicative and discursive context, context that is now lost, that were shaped by this context, to fit into this context, and that serve some uh, ideological or narrative uh, purpose uh, that we must always be aware of. It's very important. So we do not expect to find events there, but we find, but we expect to find events reshaped and narrated uh, and somehow accustomed to these very strategies that I mentioned. Good, the good news is that nowadays uh, linguistics through uh, natural language processing technologies are capable to extract and to recognize the events in the test themselves. And here is a very nice and neat example of uh, how people are starting to do that, even in the field of uh, uh, cultural heritage and uh, um, for in, in, uh, in order to answer some very important um, research uh, questions. Uh, this is an ex an, a project that is uh, managed at the University of Heidelberg and uh, it deals with uh, a corpus of uh, uh, ritual uh, texts and ritual descriptions uh, of Vedic India, and it tries to study the uh, evolution of the, um, of the rituals itself. Uh, mainly the corpus that this Heidelberg project deals with is uh, uh, composed of Vedic uh, ritual texts uh, or from uh, um, ethnologic, uh, ethnologic descriptions uh, of a later age. You see how neat, I don't know if you can read that, but I will explain you how neat this example is. Uh, we have one sentence, and the sentence, uh, the ritual instructions is, uh, uh, reads, hand over the Puya plate, I'm not an expert of Sanskrit, so I don't know if I'm reading it right, with the Siddhir Astu. With, uh, we learn from this image that really represents the work that they are doing, that the Puya plate is a worship material, and this material is handed over with, uh, with, the, uh, with also the execution of uh, uh, of a uh, ritual formula, an accompanying ritual formula. How is this done? I mean, the technologies that work behind all that are able to understand that we have an action of giving that takes place and that something, theme, one of the arguments of the giving action, is uh, given and that this something is disambiguated and recognized over there through uh, via the use of the uh, lexical resource named WordNet, 
as a, a type of plate, a type of vessel, and it is a ritual material, and this is accompanied by another process, another action that takes place, of text creation. There is something missing, though, and we will see that it's, uh, it's very interesting. Uh, typically, when you give something, and when an action of giving takes place, um, you not only, there is not only a giver, somebody will give, and something that is given. There is also somebody who is receiving that. This is not mentioned in the sentence, but neither is it um, integrated in this, represent this uh, sort of abstract representation. We do not learn the fact that in this text the mention of somebody that receives what is given is not mentioned. We should come back to that. But, so, kind of magical, isn't it? Uh, how does that work? I see a lot of grumpy faces over there. It works uh, because a lot of pre-processing of the language of those texts uh, is done in the background. And a lot of operation of what I call the natural language processing are performed on the corpus so that this interpretation is made possible. I tried to summarize uh, what kind uh, of uh, uh, pre-processing is needed in order to try this kind of uh, reconstruction, of an abstract reconstruction, and uh, uh, how the situation is for ancient Greek. And you see that it's not quite uh, as nice as we would like to. Uh, so first of all, you need some, oh yeah, by the way, in case you are wondering, uh, the Heidelberg pro uh, project deals with the Vedic text, ritual text directly from uh, the, the civilization that is studied, and uh, ethnological uh, description, all in English translation. So they are able to do that because they are working with English text. <sighs> yeah, okay, but kind of cool, but we would love to do that directly on the original. Moreover, uh, if we have this kind of a problem that may, that may run into in Heidelberg, that we have, uh, that we have uh, multiple languages involved, because the text can be in Sanskrit and the ethnologic translation can be in English, well, we would love to uh, come to that point uh, as a sort of a meta level of description of the, of the events that take place that could work exactly in the same way, either in English or in Sanskrit or in our case in ancient Greek or in Latin, by the way. Uh, that is the language that we in ancient uh, history and in, in ancient Greek and Latin uh, and Roman history will have to deal with. So, first of all, you need to chunk the text to uh, segment the text into the relevant, uh, into the relevant parts. How is that? Can we do that in ancient Greek? Yes, we can, because our digital edition that we can um, use are already uh, segmented using the standard and uh, traditional um, repartitions into books, chapter, and so on. Moreover, uh, those texts come with a punctuation that is typically added by modern editors that can be used to uh, separate uh, sentences and words. So we can do that fully automatically, no problem. Uh, but then we have to uh, analyze the grammar structure, the basic grammar structure of the sentence. We have to, to say that, for example, if it were German, Liszt, Las, Gelesen, all go under the same uh, la uh, label of the, the verb lesen. For example, we perform the kind of action that is called lemmatization. Part of speech tagging, yes. Uh, which means basically to distinguish what part of speech are we dealing with. English verb, uh, English can, does that mean uh, the modal verb I can do something or does it mean can of coke? Verb or noun? Uh, very famous example, the sentence time flies like an arrow. You all understand what it means but uh, try to put yourself into the shoes of a computer that could very well read this sentence as uh, time with a timer, take the time of uh, the insect, of the small bugs, flies, like an arrow. Doesn't mean anything, but it's completely possible in grammar. It is not possible anymore if we understand that time is a noun and not a verb. Next level, 
you go uh, understanding that if time is a noun, then it is probably the subject of the verb, and like an error is a, is a modal uh, modification of the, of the main predicate, you perform some syntactic analysis, which is in uh, computational linguistics jargon name, known as syntactic parsing. And then you come to the level of the meaning, word sense disambiguation. Arrow, does that mean the vector that is drawn and takes you from one point A to the point B or the weapon arrow? Co-reference resolution, when I say this, what do I mean? The last word that I said before, the next word that I'm going to say, and then semantic role annotation. That means that if I have an action of giving, like the one that I said before, that would probably involve somebody who gives something that is given and somebody who receives. Uh, the given thing. How are we in, uh, for ancient Greek? Not so well, with, uh, but not uh, so bad either with uh, the basic grammar. Because at least we have some standards to do that, to represent this kind of, uh, of information. Uh, but uh, to manually represent this information, we, we are not state of the art uh, in terms of uh, uh, automatic performance, reliable automatic performance of this kind of operations, but at least we have a fairly decent corpus of uh, uh, sentences that are already analyzed at this level that can also serve as a training test for our tools. But we are not in the position at all, we even don't even have started to work on semantic uh, resources for ancient Greek. So, what do we have for syntax? This thing over here. This is known as the ancient Greek dependency tree bank. So here we come finally at the definition of a tree bank. A tree bank is a corpus of sentences that are um, annotated with word by word analysis of a uh, lemma. Here we go. Part of speech tagging and also other morphological information and some synth synthetic structure. Uh, the Ancient Greek Dependency Tree Bank was started by the Persis Project in 2009, and, and it has now uh, reached the point of uh, more than uh, 350,000 words annotated. The complete text of all the Homeric poems, Gilead and Odyssey, uh, the work of uh, Hesiod, uh, all the tragedies of Aeschylus, a few tragedies of... So most of the tragedies of Sophocles and a bunch of dialogues of, Pla of Plato, and more is coming, all manually annotated. Somebody has taken the pain to enter all this kind of information. Uh, if you are very curious to know, next week I'm going to present the first paper on uh, performing some automatic work of this kind. Uh, here is the sentence, the syntactic structure of the ancient Greek dependency tree bank, represented as a tree whence the name. Uh, the syntax is represented as a dependency relation where the verb, the main verb is typically placed on top, subject is directly dependent of the verb, and other uh, complements are there. The adjectives or the relative uh, sentences depend on the noun they modify and so on. This is the kind of, uh, of annotation. So how are we trying to apply all this? In, the, in our projects on the history of Athens. We are doing this in the context of the Hellespont project. The Hellespont project focuses on the text of Thucydides, the source for the history, the main source for the history of Athens in this time frame, and its uh, main goal will be to connect two large databases of materials for the history of, for the study of uh, ancient history, the Arachne database and the uh, Persis digital library of uh, ancient texts. It will enrich the text of Thucydides with some linguistical and historical information and will try to mark the events on the test, both manually and with this kind of data-driven approach. We will try to implement some of the NLP resources that I mentioned before. And then we know also, good friend Matteo Romanello is part of this, <laughs> try to integrate secondary literature into the picture. So, here's the deal. The tree bank 
right now, the Ancient Greek Dependency Tree Bank uh, deals with uh, annotation and information at two different levels. We have the text that is chunked, as I said, divided in word, word by word, and then we are, we are already in the position to add, and we are, in fact, we have already added, uh, information on the basic grammar, the lemma and part of speech and the syntax. The goal would be to move to the third level, to, to a third level, to a three-level scenario where some of the meanings are, uh, in, and some of the semantic analysis that is needed for uh, data-driven event recognition are integrated into the text. This is possible because uh, uh, this model already exists for some languages, and in particular it is the model used by the Prague Dependency Tree Bank for Czech, modern Czech language, which integrates another layer, which is called, which is known in uh, Prague jargon as the tectogrammatical layer. It includes another level of sentence representation where some information, some supplementary information uh, that are not there in the surface syntax are added. And in particular, some semantic or thematic role of the kind, we will deal with that in, a, in detail in the uh, example part. Uh, the, kind, the kind of information uh, like uh, I mentioned before in the giving example, like it's understandable that if I give something then there is a, a giver involved in the action of giving and uh, something that is handed over to somebody. So the goal would be to integrate this level into our picture, big picture. And I will try to show you uh, what it all comes uh, to in a second. The point that I want to, to uh, make with this uh, illustration is that after this tectogrammatical level of annotation is added, our text is both easier to browse for content-related search, so it's easier to use it in the digital environment like the kind that we are uh, trying to build, and it's also more informative on historically relevant questions. So let's go to the uh, to actually showing how a tree bank where tetragrammatical annotation is made. You recognize the tree here. You see, we have a sentence. Actually, it is the very first sentence in the part uh, of the text of the city that we are dealing with. And uh, as you see, that the sentence is represented by two, three, two trees. Pardon me. The first one looks very familiar. It's the surface syntax level. So the basic syntax level. The second one looks rather more uh, complicate, and it is, and includes some uh, semantic information. Semantic information of what kind? Here you see, for example, very clear, um, that very clearly you see that we not only have the kind of uh, uh, connecting uh, that we have here, but also some supplementary colored uh, arrows that can go rather randomly. What are they? These, these are the coreference resolution that I mentioned before. This sentence in Greek mean, the Athenians uh, came to the condition in which they prospered in that way. So, uh, the condition in which they prospered, this which, the word over there, of course, relate to the condition. This is grammar. A relative pronoun goes to the anti uh, to, to, to the, the word it's uh, related to. But also you may find, you may see this, uh, this small uh, point over here, which is not a round dot, but it's a square. What does that mean? You may know that uh, quite differently from German or English, in Greek the subject may be left out who prospered. The Greek just say they came in the condition in which prospered. Because technically we say Greek is a pro-drop language. Subject is, it is the same as the subject that was uh, used before, can be left out. But we must integrate that because a computer, of course, may not know that. So who prospered? Who made that action of prosper? The Athenians. We integrate the fact that the subject is missing there and we relate that to that word over here. So we say the subject is the same as before. It's the Athenians. 
Uh, let's see another another example of that. It takes some time to load, but should be fine. Even more interesting. This is the sentence that I had in my uh, presentation on the web page of the digital classicist. We are at the end of a diplomatic crisis between Sparta and uh, uh, Athens. Uh, the Athenian leader Themistocles played a sort of a trick to attain his goal, which the Spartans did not like. But at the same time, the Athenians Spa uh, ambassadors are in Sparta and the Spartans ambassadors are in Athens, so that no uh, retortion is possible. This sentence means the ambassadors of both parts uh, got back home uh, without any further charge. Without any further charge is an adverb. So, first of all, the ambassador of both parts. Let's say that we want information on this, on this uh, specific event. Which parts? How do we know that? Here we go. The coreference annotation can go from one sentence to the other, so we can go to the part of the text where those two parts were mentioned. And here it is visualized in this tree as a, a hidden link somehow to Spartans and Athenians. So we integrate this information without any, f any further charge to be pressed. Who is uh, pressing or is not pressing any charge? Of course, Athenians are not pressing charges against the Spartan ambassadors. Spartans ambassadors are not taking, uh, pressing any charge against the Athenians. So, so we integrate all the three information here. Uh, who is, is uh, uh, pressing charges? And you see this, uh, spe this special lemma here means recipro that the, the reciprocity action takes place. So both part against each other. But again, it is, we learn that it's each other because we have this link. And so, uh, and so we integrate all the information that is semantically needed by this adverb without pressing any charge, which, by the way, etymologically comes from the verb to press charge. So we integrate the same, uh, same structure that we may have if we had the verb. So the, the information means who's pressing charge, against whom, about what. All this information are missing over there. We integrate that. So we do the kind of thing that, as I said before, is not done in the Heidelberg project. If something is missing in the text, we would like to know whether it is missing because it is implied by the context, and so it is there, actually, or it is not mentioned. For example, here, this gen lemma just means that the city does not bother to say, or it just lived it out of this text, uh, uh, leave it out of the te this text, what kind of charges, charges was pressed. Another information that it's kind of uh, interesting to have. Uh, let's stick for a second to the problem of coreference, and I will show you something. You, of course, may interrupt me whenever you find it uh, necessary. Uh, because whenever I say, whenever I say um, co-reference, whenever I say this, I can mean this, the last item that I, that I the last words that I uttered, uh, or this, the things that I have been saying for quite a long time now, so all the content of my talk, for example. This kind of information, this kind of distinction is actually made in this tree bank. We distinguish this kind of, uh, of co-references because we call one textual co-reference and it is marked here with arrow to the exact point where the co-reference uh, goes or it is just called the segment co-reference. So whenever we want to, uh, to see where to see this make reference to something that is too big uh, to be simply pointed with an arrow, we can just search and we draw in this software for interrogation of tree banks, a very, very simple uh, uh, query. We can draw visually a simple query like this. We can uh, actually perform the query. If I just find the, uh, 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 can I find the button to perform the query itself? be a specialist of this software, but I don't see it. Maybe it's just because uh, 
Well, give me a second. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so. Let's see where this, uh, this kind of segment coreference takes place. Of course, this, we already seen an example, the sentence that I quoted before. The Athenians come to the position in which they prospered in this way. And that means that all segment of text we are dealing with is introduced like this. So it's isolated with the contextual coreference. But we go even further because we see that it's very interesting. Okay, so this sentence is not exactly uh, interesting, but this one is. After we finish to tell the um, incident that I mentioned before, how the, the Athenians come to build their wall, uh, the opposition of the Spartans notwithstanding, Thucydides just say, so the Athenians in this way came to rebuild their wall. We find with that a, peri uh, a period. So we find, we find that this is actually a very interesting way to chunk the text in bigger session, in bigger session that deal with the content, okay? So up to that point, this, uh, the, the text has told the story of how the Athenians rebuild the wall. We have a, a, a final, uh, final point. Then again, to see the start to show, uh, to tell how the, the, the wall uh, was actually built technically, not how the, the project was, uh, uh, was taken uh, care of. And, uh, oops, I'm sorry, I was wrong here. After he finished this, end, the, this section, to see the same, okay, in this way, the Athenians built their wall. So again, another, another point. So this is a, doesn't work exactly because very seldom we have a, a, an introduction, a, a, ring, a complete ring structure that says, in this way, meaning what follows, uh, narration, in this way, meaning what preceded, so that we can frame exactly. Uh, but if we combine this kind of, uh, of uh, research with some lexical research. So for example, we, we see that it used, uh, the Thucydides used a verb like building the wall. And so we can go to the, to the first uh, occurrence of uh, something that is related to the action of building a wall. Uh, we can actually have a data-driven uh, way to segment the text, uh, but uh, talking about the content but using the content of the narration itself, not only from formal uh, structure. So uh, maybe another thing that's interesting to mention, and then I probably uh, conclude, is, well, maybe we can go back to the, or we can use this sentence. And um, yeah, for example, this word mean, this verb here means to besiege. What is besiege? What is besieged here? It's uh, the city of Byzantium. It is not mentioned, it's left out because he mentioned that before, but we integrate that. How do we integrate this kind of information? Uh, we do that because contextually we are working to a resource that uh, is called um, valency lexicon. Valency lexicon does exactly, is a lexicon that records the kind of information that I started with, with uh, when I explained the Heidelberg project. Uh, it represents and defines what kind of arguments of uh, information is needed uh, for each verb or if, if, uh, each action. So for example, here we got uh, a verb that means uh, uh, to counsel. And I integrated the fact that a verb that means to counsel needs somebody who counsel, something, some counsel that is given, and somebody this counsel is given to. So we are, at the same time that we are performing this annotation, we know what kind of uh, information we need to integrate and to distinguish whether this information is missing in the text because it is implied by the context, like this kind of, like here, this first verb means to 
launch an expedition against Byzantium and they besieged. Besieged what? Byzantium, of course. And again, so the object of the, of the verb is missing, but again, is uh, clearly inferable from the contest and this link is made explicit in the tree bank. But we know that we must integrate this because we have a resource uh, lexicon that will tell us, okay, we need this information because a verb that means besiege cannot logically stay without this. Uh, actually, there is a linguistic test which is called the dialogue test. Try to imagine, I tell you, oh, they besieged, and you answer, they besieged what? I cannot say, I don't know, because otherwise I'd look like a fool, don't I? And uh, so this is basically a rough idea, but we, I really love this part of this um, illustration of linguistic annotation to be inter more interactive, so we, can, we will come back to it. Let me just conclude with a few remarks and then we, we can go back to the trees. <sighs> to summarize my point, our literary sources, like they are, are not uh, structure for semantic event-based queries. Natural language processing technique uh, for event extraction are not yet capable of dealing with this kind of complex uh, texts like ancient Greek literary documents. Uh, but NLP tools and techniques can be adapted to this task. Uh, we can have standards to work with, so basically guidelines and models to map this information. They can help speed manual. What is already there can help speed manual annotation. And incidentally, they had a lot of information on linguistic aspects of the documentary sources that can be helped, that can be, that can be of uh, great importance for the understanding of, uh, of our sources on, the, uh, on ancient history. And that is basically the point that I wanted to make. <laughs>